You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications button so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. And they just worked out that it was with all these really quite bad people. Mm. You know, but I didn't know they were bad at the beginning. Was that an attraction for you because you were brought up I well? It must have been. I don't know why. <laughs> why on earth was I? I was a spoiled little brat of the family as well. Mm-hmm. So why did I do that? But I did, so that's just how it is. Mm-hmm. But that's the way it went. And then little did I know I was going to end up married Mick. <laughs> <laughs> One of the worst ones of them all. <laughs> so, oh my God. <laughs> So everybody, obviously, Charlie's changed his name so many times. You've Charlie Salvador, Charlie Bronson, but his real name's what, Michael? I know him as Michael Peter. I don't know him as Charlie Salvador Mm -hmm. or um, Bronson, really. It's Michael Peter. That's why I call him Mick. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can't call him Charlie because he's not Charlie to me. He's Mick. But this seven years, it was awful. You got seven years for one crime, seven years for another one, seven years for another one. That was 21. And then he got four years, then I think it was three years and another one year. For all these different crimes, I just didn't know what was going on. I didn't know anything about it. Because he never used to tell me anything at all about going to court, but it was horrendous. It was the most horriblest thing ever. He was still lovely towards us and everything. But, I mean, I'd, I'd go to see him with Mike and he'd have all these bruises all over his face and... He used to say, oh, it's okay, don't worry, it's nothing, I've just banged my head or I've just done this. But it was just, it was like all the time and I thought, he's never going to get out of here, he keeps fighting and, oh, it's horrible, it's a horrible thing to see, you know, because you're not, you've got no control over it. I mean, he's your husband and the dad of your son, but what can you do? What's he done? He's not murdered anyone, he's not a child killer, he's not a paedophile, he's not a rapist. His crime, people think he is a murderer. People have said to me, <coughs> excuse me, people have actually said to me, well, he's a murderer, isn't he? That's why he's in prison. He's in prison because he's fought the system and they don't want to release him. Boom, we're on. And today's guest, we've got Irene Dunro. Yeah, Irene, that's me. Hi, good to have you on. Hello. So, where do I look for the thing? You look good. You look great. Oh yeah. So, Hi. Charlie Bronson's ex-wife, first wife, first wife ex-wife. Um, you've just released about the truth, whole the truth, whole truth, and nothing but the truth. We'll leave in the link in the description to get it. A lot of photos, a lot of stories in there about Charlie untold stories. Yeah. How's life? Definitely. Life is lovely at the moment. I'm being interviewed by you for this podcast. Mm-hmm. I didn't even know what a podcast was until I've been looking it up on the internet, saying, what's a podcast? Mm-hmm. But um, I'm not into internet because, you know, we didn't have things like that when I was young. But Mick did phone me last night and said, oh, he said, um, you've got so many viewers and everything and you sell your book and everything. You need to get out there and sell your book. And he's so proud of me because he said it's a fabulous book. He said it's sad, which it is. It's really sad in places, but it's dead funny as well. Um, because I am a bit funny, really. I'm that sort of person, a bit weird in a way. You know, I have all the girls that were laughing their heads off at me all the time. But um, you've got to bring humour into things, haven't you? I no. mean, I do it and I don't mean to do it. It's just mm. my voice comes out weird. So you are, so, Charlie's been in for what, nearly 40, over 45 years and you're still in contact? Oh, yeah. Well, we only got in contact after 26 years because a friend of his, Ray Williams, wanted Mike to get in touch with his dad. He thought it'd be a nice surprise, which they did do, and that was all that. But um, after that, after the 26 years, Mick used to send me cards or a letter in with Mike's letter. You know, he always used to ask about how I was and stuff like that. So that was good. Yeah, so you've got a son with Charlie who's, how old is he Michael. now? He's 50, just turned 50. 50. I've just turned 70 the other day. And Mick's, Mike, Mike is 50. You look great for 70. <sighs> Soon I'll be 80. So that's how long <laughs> you've known Charlie in over 50 yeah, years? Well, uh, yeah, nearly 50 years, yeah. yeah. So I know, got... but you know what? It's only like yesterday. It. I mean, when you have ex, ex-husbands or ex-boyfriends, 
um, when you're with them, you're thinking, God, it was so long ago. And it's not not there in your face. But with, uh, with Mick, it's in my face all the time. It's weird. It's really, really weird. He's just there in my face. I don't know if it's because we never actually split up. Do you know what I mean? When you 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 get divorced or whatever, you you finish with your husband, don't you? Mm-hmm. That sort of thing, or your ex partners. But with Mick, we've n- never actually split up. He was just like taken away, and I don't know if that's it. But it's just like yesterday. I mean, I was coming home from work the other day on the bus, and I was just looking through the window. We stopped at this bus stop so the driver could just swap drivers, and I was just looking out of the window, and suddenly I felt sick as a dog. I felt all this stuff come all over me and I felt all panicky and stressed and I just felt as if I was in Chester Crown Court you know this was only the other day and Mick was getting sentenced you still get that feeling it's just all over you it's horrible yeah. you never get rid of it yeah before we get into you and uh, uh, Charlie stuff like, let's go back to the start where you grew up and how your life began yeah well I, I lived um, in Little Neston not far away from here um, Mum and Dad were quite quite well to do, sort of thing. And Dad built a lovely, great big house, as you know that one there. But it was very, very strict. And I was the youngest. I had two older sisters and an older brother. And uh, Pauline and Janet, who are my older sisters, were really, really posh. And they used to get all these posh boys, and all their boyfriends were loaded, had big posh cars and everything. And they used to have brothers who were, um, you know, about my age. And um, the parents used to have like ponds in the garden. They used to skate over them in the winter. And they always used to want me to go with them to uh, meet all these younger boys, the younger brothers. I was never interested. Do you want me to go back a bit further than Just this one? Whatever not? you want. Yeah. On your go, just finish that story. Oh, yeah. So I go backwards and forwards. That's me. Mm. I get all mixed up my words. Um, but when I was young, mum and dad, well, not mum, but dad came from a farm. He had, they had a farm. There's like seven brothers and one sister who I'm named after. Her name was Irene as well, Irene Kelsey. I actually went to a funeral and I thought it was my funeral because it was like she was born Irene Kelsey and all that. But um, they had this lovely farm with thought and hope we still have. But then the war started. So they all went away to war. And then my older uncle, Uncle Charlie, he stayed and took over the farm to keep all the wheat going and corn going. And then after the war finished, um, one of my uncles, Uncle Ernie, came back to live on the farm. But he fell out with my auntie, Auntie Nora. So he turned to live in this little tiny shed that was on the farm. But he became a gunsmith. And he was a really famous gunsmith because he used to sell these guns to um, Sean Connery. Is that the name? Sean Sean Connery. Connery. And do you know that racing driver, that dead famous fast um, racing car driver? He sold all the guns to all those sort of people, film stars, celebrities and the toffs and everything. And um, they used to go like... Clay pigeon shooting, is it or something? Well, I yeah. think it was. I hope it was for, <laughs> I don't know who he's selling it for otherwise. I hope so. But the whole shed was lined with all these really expensive guns. But he was a gunsmith. But in the end, he just lived in that shed. He had made a bed in there. He was just founded by his guns, but he is very eccentric. So that was the sort of beginning. Um, but all our family are dead eccentric anyway, mm-hmm. I'm afraid. So what were you like at school? Were you a quiet kid or shy? Oh, I was dead shy. I was a Miss Goody Goody. Mm-hmm. Very, very good. But um, we had this thing at school that we had to start learning to do um, knitting on four needles. This is in the primary school. I couldn't do it. We had to bit these bloody horrible red mittens on four needles. But I don't know why, I just couldn't do it. So I never got it done. So the teacher always used to shout at me, Irene, Irene, bring your knitting in, do that. And I used to pretend I'd forgotten it. I said, I'm so sorry, I forgot this again. But in the end, I had to bring it in. And I used to sew the needles and we had needle craft, thread all the needles and do the sewing for all my friends. And they used to do a bit of knitting for me. But I had to stand outside the headmaster's office one of those days because I never took them in, I just refused to take them in. So I I got shouted at, Mm -hmm. standing outside the headmaster's office for not taking my knitting in. 
Yeah. But they never got finished. I hated that. Mm-hmm. That was the only time I got shouted at. Yeah, so being a kid then, growing up in a good environment, being a little good at two shoes, what was the attraction to Charlie when you first met him? Oh, well, it's funny because... Um, I said I had older sisters and an older brother and they all really looked after me and I was brought up really you know really really well sort of thing so um I started to go out with my friend when I was about 14 15 Lynn Whitby oh she was lovely we used to go to Liverpool for Chinese and we thought the bees and knees we used to wear the latest clothes and everything and that was fabulous and then a couple of years after I started to go out and about with um a couple of other friends that used to like to go to Liverpool, right? And that's when we started to uh, sort of stay out a bit later and things like that. And it wasn't such a goody, goody gun shoes. And every time we met, you know, different blokes on a night out, they would offer to bring us home. They had lovely cars, fabulous cars, all lovely posh cars, Jags and all the different things. And they used to take us home, drop us off. It was only afterwards that I'd, I found out that they're all stolen. All these cars, all these blokes were like, right, even though they might look lovely and polite and everything, but they were like, um, what do you call them? They used to pinch cars and everything and wherever. Mm-hmm. But anyway, I'm thinking, oh, my God, this isn't very good, is it, going this way? And then um, I went to a club uh, with my other friends in New Brighton. I can't remember what it's called now. And I got, um, met this man. He was really ha- dead handsome. He's gorgeous. And his friend, and his friend's girlfriend who was pregnant. And I started to go out with him. And um, one of his friends came up to me one night when he was at the bar and said, Irene, um, I, I think you're far too good for, for him. You know, he's in and out of Borstal and things like that. So I said, oh, no, it doesn't matter. Don't worry. I didn't even know what Borstal was, you know. So I started to go out with him. Um, and then he used, he went back to Borstal again and he wrote me a letter and mum found it in my drawer and she went mad because mum and dad were so strict. You see, all my older sisters were into the posh, posh and really everything. I just went the opposite way. Bad I boy. Yeah, I would not go skating. I would not go um, playing tennis at the tennis club. I just wanted to do my own thing. And they just worked out that it was with all these really quite bad people mm-hmm. you know but i didn't know they were bad at the beginning was that an attraction for you because you were brought up I well it must have been i don't know why <laughs> why on earth was i, I was a spoiled little brat mm-hmm. of the family as well mm-hmm. so why did i do that but i did so that's just how it is mm-hmm. that's the way it went and then little did i know i was going to end up married mick <laughs> <laughs> one of the worst ones of them all <laughs> so oh my god so how did you meet well um one of my friends lynn whitby um i know a school friend not my other friends one of the old school friends she there's this group playing at this pub in great southern called the bull and it was all live music and she had no one to go with so i said okay then i'll come with you as a favor so i went with her um, so in Great Sutton, on like the, just before the roundabout, we went and sat down and the group started to play. And then the next thing, two minutes after that, this these two men came in, John and Mick. It was John and Mick. And um, they were both dead dressed up in those days. You know, you wore suits and ties or cravettes and little pockets in. And they came in. And me and Linda saw them. We both went like that and looked at them. And they both looked at us as they walked past to go to the bar. And then they went to the bar and they're staring at us. And I was saying, Linda, Linda, I like that man there. And then said, oh, yes, I like the other one as well and all that sort of thing. And the next thing, they just came over to us. Um, they hadn't even bought a drink. They just went to the bar and must have discussed something. And they came over and said, oh, would you two nice um, young girls would like a drink or something? So I said, oh, yeah, please, could I have a cherry bean cider? And I don't know what Linda had. So they went back and bought us our drinks. And that's how we met them. They just came over. But I really fancied Mick. But Linda actually married John as well. But they did get divorced not long afterwards. But it was weird. But they, they were both really good looking. So everybody, obviously Charlie's changed his name so many times. You've Charlie Salvador, Charlie Bronson, but his real yeah. name's what, Michael? I know him as Michael Peter. I don't know him as Charlie Salvador mm-hmm. or um, Bronson, really. It's Michael Peter. That's why I call him Mick. Mm-hmm. I mean, I can't call him Charlie because he's not Charlie to me. He's Mick. Yeah. 
So what was the relationship? How did it start? Was it nice or was it So madness? yeah, oh yeah, he was a gentleman. He was always a gentleman. Honestly, he was so polite. I mean, I don't think you get it nowadays. You used to open the car doors. He would never, ever swear in front of me. And if somebody started swearing, if we were out in a club or a pub or something, and I could hear raised voices and they were swearing, he would just go over to them politely. He wouldn't be nasty. He would just say, can you um, stop, just watch your language just in front of my girlfriend, would you please? You know, he was always like that. You know, I could always depend on Mick that in those days. He was really... Really, I just felt safe with him. Was there ever any telltale signs that it was it was a mad? Pardon? Was, was there ever any telltale signs that it was mad then? Well, no. You might never see that anyway. You no. might never see that it was a mad. But obviously, with the stories no. you hear and the things that he's done, no. it, it, it is it, mad. Yeah, no, prison's done that to him. Prison's tent. He wasn't like that at all. No, he was not at all. But he used to take after we had a night out or something. He always used to go in foursomes most of the time with John and Linda. But um, sometimes we used to go on our own when we got a bit closer and sort of thing. And then um, he used to take me to this place in Ellesmere Port. And, and there, it's probably one of the roughest places ever. But it was by the docks. And apparently, there's a, well, it was. There was a lovely Chinese restaurant on this sort of part here. And then if you sort of walked in the back, you went up like a dark alley. But it was still in the this room sort of thing and it was like a bar that used to stay open for the sailors all night long and then if you turned right no left and went up the stairs you had to go right up the stairs quite a long way then you get the loose and everything but so because of that we used to have our food and everything and then the, a fight would always break out it was always you know brawling would start about one o'clock or something so that's why I eat so fast because everybody says to me, for God's sake, slow down. Why are you eating? No one's going to take your food off you. But as soon as we'd order a meal, right, never have a starter. I always used to have king prawn fried rice. It was the best Chinese restaurant ever. I'm not joking. It was fab. And as soon as it come, I'd go eat it dead fast and everything. And then you can guarantee within about 20 minutes, half an hour of, of uh, us having our food, there'd be something going on or somebody would, some bloke would come over to Mick and whisper in his ear and then Mick would get up and say, oh, sorry, Irene, I'm just going to book you, a t get so-and-so to book you a taxi now to go home. A fight's just started in, in the back. And that's what they used to do. See, it was the 60s or was it the 70s or wherever? Mm -hmm. But that's what they used to do. They used to just do it for... Like there's the mods and the rockers. The mods used to fight the rockers, but it wasn't any rockers and mods in Elsmere Port. It was just the sailors and they'd all get pissed or whatever. But that's what they used to do. It was sport, but nobody ever got killed or stabbed or people drunk off their heads or uh, what's that word, drugged up or anything. Mm -hmm. Nobody, they might have had a broken nose and things like that. But that's about it. That's all that would have happened to them. But Mick would always, if there was like two people against one man, Mick would go, even though he didn't know the man, he would go and even it out. That's what it was. It was just a bit of sport. So our food, that was the end of the night, even though I hadn't finished my food. And I'd always look round when in the taxi and there I'd see Mick standing at the bottom well, underneath, lying down, underneath oh, about 20 men on top of him and they're all fighting each other <laughs> like that. That was always my last uh -huh. memory of yeah. Mick. I but, always remember sitting, it was just like yesterday, sitting in the taxi. I was used to sit in the back of the taxi and I used to look round and I'd see all these bloody fists and everything. <laughs> and there was a Mick, see, bit of Mick's trousers sticking out. There's always a big gang of them right on top of each other all fighting. Did they like fighting? Yeah, but that's what it was in them days. But it wasn't like killing or stabbing. It was just fun. It was sport. But did you never think, what am I doing here? Or was it, again, no, an attraction main, to my you? My main thought at the time was, bloody hell, I just want to finish my bloody food. Mm -hmm. You know, and do like a pudding after it instead of just rushing. But I always had to eat. That's why I eat so fast. Because since I go in there, I know something would kick off later on. Because it was like late night opening. And I put all the sailors used to go there and whatever. They'd all be drunk and everything. So I used to be food dead fast and like that. Mm -hmm. How was uh, Charlie when you were with, like, if other men tried to speak to you or anything? Was he a jealous type or was he? Oh, God, yeah. It was so possessive. 
Yeah, very, very, very possessive. Oh God, my God, he was dead possessive. And when we got married, I used to be dead trendy and used to wear like suede shorts and then um, big long boots and, and it was, you know all matching and everything like that. And he liked all that. But since we got married, he said, "No, nope, right, Irene." He said, "We're married now. You can't wear all those sort of clothes." He hated me wearing, and even if I just, I never used to wear makeup anyway in those days. But if I just wore some beads, can remember beads were the fashion, you know, great big beads with the fashion. I've still got them beads with the fashion those days. He'd go mad, absolutely mad. He said, you're a married woman now. You can't wear things like that. You're married to me. You must not wear things like that anymore. And I remember one day, I think it was the 21st, we were going to go for this lovely meal. So he didn't, he didn't take his car. We, we walked up and we went, I remember we had to go past this um, news agent right on the, the Chester High Road. Well, not this Chester High Road, another one towards like um, Elsmere Port. I don't know what that's called, but it's like a big, long main road. And he went in to get some ciggies. And when he came out, a car had gone past with a man in it and he'd bibbed me. And then Mick came running out for our cig cigarettes. Who's that? Who's that? Who's that? Who's bibbing you? He must know you to bib you. And he took me home. He took me, he wouldn't take me out. He said, you must know that man. He took me straight home. And I was so bloody annoyed that I actually went home. And he came in with me and he shut the door. And, and then he went out and I looked through the window and there he was walking up the road. I think that was the time I got all his clothes and his suits and just threw him out of the bedroom window after him because he was really particular about his clothes and his suits. He had to look dead smart and, you know, really, really dead smart. So I threw them all out of the window. I'm thinking, oh, he's going to come back now because he loves his suits. But he didn't come back. He didn't come back to the following day. But I did notice when I got up, all the suits, and they were all being cleared up, and he took them to the cleaners. Hmm. Well, when, did you get, like. when did you get married? How far, how far into your uh, relationship? Well, we got married when I was 19 um, and Mick was, Mick, well, Mick was 19, even though he thinks he's younger than me. He thinks he's my toy boy. God knows. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he really does. He really does think, but he's not. He's, he's actually older than me. But um, we were both 19. But I moved into a flat because I had a party at my mum and dad's house. Um, mum and dad went away to Wales for the weekend. And my older brother... Um, organised this big party in mum and dad's house and he had all his friends and they were all um, I don't know what they were doing but they were like drinking this and drinking that and drinking that they took over the whole house um, they had all the food that mum had got me in the cupboards and they were cooking it in this big essay mum had a big essay they are cooking it in there and it was all ruined they broke cupboards um, the next door neighbours phoned the police because uh, of all the noise and everything. Everybody was in bed with other people. It was all going on and everything. So I phoned Mick. I said, oh, Mick, I said, um, it's all going on here. Come and you know, rescue me. So Mick took me out. He came, picked me up and he just took me away. And then when everybody had gone, came back and he stayed with me for a few days. Mm -hmm. But mum and dad sort of threw me out then. What did your mum and dad think of him? Um, they went too keen on Mick. Why? I don't really know. I really don't know. They never actually said, but I just, I don't know. They weren't too keen. I think dad might have had, um, he's a bit psychic -y like me. I think he might have had an instinct too, because I was like um, the babby of the family. I mean, I was still called the babby of the family when I was 50. Mm -hmm. My dad used to say, oh, is a babby coming? You know, so. Uh, Seeing the film. When he does the robbery, does he not rob jewellery? Is that jewellery for you? Oh, I d no, no. He never did anything like that. To be honest, I never knew that he had ever, um, whatever he did, he kept it all well away from me. Mm -hmm. He never used to say to me, oh, Harry, I'm going to go and burgle somewhere today. I'm going to go and rob this. It was all completely, n you know, nothing at all. But when I was... Um, when I moved to live in this flat with my friend Linda, who's going out with John, that's when Mick started to stay more often with me. And that's how we got closer and closer. That's the first time I slept with him, actually. I was horrified. Why? Because <laughs> he was so big and whatever. And that. 
so, and I was so innocent. But anyway, that that's an end of the story about that. <laughs> Yeah, we'll forget about that. <laughs> but um, I, um, you know, that was it. He used to be be there. But every now and again, he used to disappear when he's supposed to be staying with me. I mean, he'd get up at like two o'clock in the morning and disappear. Or he'd say, oh, just going out for a pint. And then he'd go out, but he wouldn't come back till like two days. Mm. And he'd have all these bruises all over his face. You know, and I say, oh, my God, what's happened? He'll say, oh, nothing, or, or I just had a hangover and I just, I just went back to mum and dad's or something. But there's one point during this time before we got married that there's something big going on because John was out going out with his girlfriend. I don't know if I'm allowed to say this. I don't want to get, you know, any prison or anything. I don't want to go, I couldn't cope in prison, I'm telling you that now. What was the relationship like for the four or five years you were with each other? Was um, it love or was it anger? Bef or was it before what? When you was the, the four years was it four years before he went to prison? Oh yeah, no. Oh no, he was fab. As I yeah. say, he was so gentlemanly and everything, and he was lovely. He used to look after me, and he loved Mike and everything. Well, actually, when Mike was um, got born, was in El um, Classbridge Hospital. Mick, uh, I, I was getting all the pains and everything, and Mick was all panicking and everything. And his mum said, you better phone a an ambulance and take Irene rather than drive her there. So he got an ambulance and he came with me. And then in those days, you weren't allowed to be together when you, you, you know, you had um, had a baby or anything. So he had to sit outside the room. So he was waiting outside the room and he must have waited about 24 hours. And I could hear him saying, is she all right? Is she all right? But the, he just wasn't allowed in. Anyway, when um, Mike was eventually born, he came in, he was so proud. But then he had to walk all the way back from Clatterbridge, which is in Bebbington, to Ellesmere Port because he had no shoes on. Nothing on. He had no money in. He just had to walk barefooted all the way home with no money or anything because he was in panic. So he just went, mm -hmm. yeah, just. So when did he get, his, was it seven years ago when you were married to him? His first sentence, well, actually it was, oh, Crown Court was off. It was the same Crown Court that Myra Hindley and um, Ian Brady were in. I was thinking, and the judge had a wig on and I was thinking, what the hell's Mick doing in here? I always had a thing about courts because Mick has been backwards and forwards a few times before before this. You know, things he's done in, you know, in the past. And I remember him going to court and thinking, oh my God, is he going to come home today? Is he going to come home today or not? Or whatever, what's what's going to happen? Oh, it was horrible, really, really horrible. And he used to say to me, oh no, um, the judge was really nice today. He was in a good mood, so he let me off today. Now, any other time, he said, if the judge had been in a bad mood, he'd say, no, you're going to go to prison. Because that's how it is. It doesn't depend on your film sentence. Apparently, this is true. A judge depends on his mood. If the, mood, if the judge is in a really, really bad mood, he's going to say, oh, well, go off, piss off, go off, go off to prison, wherever. But if he's in a good mood, he's not going to say that. And that's what happened to Mick. But this seven years, it was awful. He got seven years for one crime, seven years for another one, seven years for another one. That was 21. And then he got four years. Then I think it was three years and another one year. For all these different crimes, I just didn't know what was going on. I didn't know anything about it. Because mm -hmm. he never used to tell me anything at all about going to court, but it was horrendous. It was the most horriblest thing ever. Why do you think he never told you? Well, he never told me anything like that. What he was never... he charged with? Um, it was robbing this um, news agent's for armed robbery. But it was actually three of his friends had actually done it all. He just went along with them. And John was also asked to go along as well to do it. But he said, no, you got seven pounds. But I mean, it wasn't like it's was armed robbery when people get killed and... Loads of people get threatened and all that and masks. It wasn't like that at all. But he got seven years for that. And he's kind of not been out since, has he? No, no. All th those three people that's, that's, that did it all, planned it all, they got out after two years mm -hmm. and mixed in there. But then Mick had all the um, added on pressure, added on, because he was only young then. These were a lot older, these men. And, uh, he, you know, 
he was attacked with glass. He's been attacked with everything. It's it's been horrendous. Or he's been made to dress up as a woman with makeup all over his face, and then get raped by all the men. What do you do? Would you would you like to pretend to be a woman and get raped by all the men just for a bit of peace, or would you retaliate? Retaliate. Yeah. So if you retaliate, he was always the one that got all the blame because he was always he always got the one up on them. So what was happening? Who was dressing? Every no, well, he didn't, but that's what it was like in prison. He had all sorts of horrendous things going on because he used to write to me and tell me what's happened. It was horrendous, and he had to stick up for himself. That's why he made himself strong. He even had one of the prison governors in one of the prisons he was in taunting him outside his cell. Oh, I've got your back now, Mickey. He said, I've got your back now. I'm going to make your life hell. You don't, you don't know half of what's gone on. It's horrendous. What, so was he getting bullied at the start, Charlie? Well, he, he's, I know he was getting about 20 prison officers beating him to a pulp every now and again. He used to call them the heavy gang. Mm. 20 at a time. Like Mick said, if you p push punch one person in prison, you get 20, 25 back. He was always the heavy gang. That's why I could never bear to watch his film. Because they actually sneaked some footage out and you actually saw him guess it. I don't know if it's a film or the documentary that we did, but um, some footage was sneaked out of the, one of the prisons and you actually saw what went on. It was all, it was being filmed live. He had a thing and it was being filmed and you saw them all pouncing on him. It was just unbearable. Do you think then he, at the start he's been pushed to the edge where he's just snapped and then he, he rebels? Well, of course, yeah. With rubbing the butter on himself and fighting all the prison guards, taking people hostage like... Because the papers make out as if he's a madman. Yeah, well, the, the, well, the papers do, yeah, and yeah. the prison do. But the prison aren't going to turn around and say, oh, well, we did this or we did that. They just say, the papers are just stating, um, Charles Bronson kicked off at this, he's taking people hostages or something. They don't say the real reason why or um, what's really went on. But at one point, Mick was um, going to go to his dad's funeral and the prison said, yes, you can go. He had his suit already. He was all dressed in his cell. If it's his dad or his brother, John, who died for cancer, is one of them anyway. And he's all dressed to go. And then the morning of the funeral, the, you know, after he got all ready and everything, they went into cell. Oh, oh, you're not going to the funeral today. And that was one of the reasons why he kicked off. But they didn't put, report that in the paper. They just said, um, Charles Bronson's kicked off again. You see, there's things they do to him. They're doing things now to him. They're trying to, um, they're making his phone calls or they took, stopped all his phone calls. And now he can't leave messages or anything, even though he's paying to have the messages left and everything. Because that's what they do. They don't want him to get out. They just want to kick, kick, keep him in there forever because he's fighting the system. What sort of stuff did they used to write to you to oh, tell you well, what was going on in well, prison? Well, I used to hate those letters like one a week because some me I always used to call them like a good week or a bad week I used to dread it because one week it'd be lovely a lovely letter I love you I love Mike and everything and I won't be long I'll soon be coming out of here and everything really fabulous like that and then the next week you start getting this horrible feeling feeling sick before you'd open it you'd know it was like you know, something's happened, something's gone on, so he's not at his best and everything. And he's saying, sorry, Irene, I've lost so much remission. I had to go to a VC. Somebody came up to me and tried to stab me with a bit of glass or someone came to do this and some and that. So what am I supposed to do? I have to retaliate, I have to protect myself. And I'm the one that's getting more years added on. This went on and on and on. And then in the end... He started to write a letter to me saying, sorry, Irene, I'm getting more time added on. And that's when I thought, he's never going to get out. How long did you stick by him for? Oh, well, I'm not very good with years. I've had three different birthdays, for God's sake. I'm terrible yeah. with dates. don't even know my own But kids. was it that time you said, OK, I need a divorce here? Like, where? Um, that was actually Mick that actually said that. He How said, look, he said, you're going to have to, Irene. He said, I'm never going to get out of here. And I knew he wasn't going to get out of there. I had actually said, if you just carry on like this, you're going to end up in um, Broadmoor or a mental hospital because you can't keep fighting everybody. You've got to stop. You've just got to do it. You know, let them bloody beat you up. Let them do whatever they want. Don't, don't fight them. And this was a time when he was covered in all these bruises and everything after a one of our visits. Um... 
So he'd been kicking off again there or something. Uh, and anyway, three years after, he was moved to Broadmoor. Did you see the change in him before he went to prison to a few years yeah. after? Yeah. In what way? Yeah. Oh, he was um, he was still lovely towards us and everything. But, I mean, I'd, I'd go to see him with Mike and he'd have all these bruises all over his face. And he used to say, oh, it's okay, don't worry, it's nothing. I've just banged my head or I've just done this. But it was just, it was like all the time. And I thought, he's never going to get out of here. He keeps fighting and, oh, it's horrible. It's a horrible thing to see, you know, because you're not, you've got no control over it. I mean, he's your husband and the dad of your son, but what can you do? You know, you can't stop it. You, you know, he's in there. And if they're all going to beat him up or whatever, or he's going to retaliate, but he's not had to, he's had a horrendous time in there. What was it like at Broadmoor visiting? Oh, I never went to Broadmoor and I, I couldn't. I went to Walton. I went to Walton to see him. And that was the, I think Walton was the first time I went to see him. I went with his mum. And this before he was um, sentenced properly, he was on remand. And I remember going in this, this like, it was like a cell. The waiting room was like a cell. There was all like, you know, like an old castle with all like big red bricks. And then there's just like cardboard seats, well, wooden seats, like benches. And I was sitting there and think, God, this is a horrible, horrible place. And then after that, we moved into this other room. And then we had to sit down this table. This is more like a canteen. And then Mick was led out and he sat opposite us and he said to me, oh, would you like a cup of tea? And I said, oh, I said, oh, can you have tea in here? Because I love my cups of tea. I said, oh, can you have, actually have a cup of tea in here? He said, yes, I'll go and get you. So he went and got me and, me and his mum mom from the thing, from the thing. And I thought, so, oh, prison's fine, isn't it? It's great in here. You know, you only have to have a cup of tea because I was terrified when I walked in. It was horrendous. But then thought, oh, this is fine. You can have cups of tea. But then Mike used to run after him when he walked out crying, Daddy, Daddy, come back. And How hard does that take in your son to horrible. see his father in prison? It's horrendous. Horrible. Especially when he runs after him crying, shouting, Daddy, Daddy, come back, come back. When he's led away, it's, you can't do anything about it, can you? How did Charlie deal with that? Well, he couldn't do anything about it. He was just, just taken out. How's it, like, when did you really start to see the effects of his prison time? How many years in? The the effect, well, it was when he started to, um, just before he went to Broadmoor, I just knew he was never going to get out. I just knew it. Yeah, it's sad, and even that, Mick that. said as well, even Mick said to me, look, I mean, he said, I am never going to get out of here. But when Mike was only a toddler before he did this, the really big crime, because as I say, I never knew anything about any of the crimes. Um, Mike, I just picked Mike up from play school and he was watching the telly in his little chair. He used to watch the kids' programmes and the news came on about 12 o'clock. And Mick came home from work and he said, do you know what, Irene? And I said, what? He said, I'm going to be on that television one day. You're going to see me on that news. And I thought, oh. And that came true as well. Mm -hmm. But as I say, Mick would never, ever say anything to me about anything i mean when mike was a baby we used to walk all the way from Ellesmere port to mum and dad's house and we used to go past these great big mansions that had big high up walls and mick used to always push the pram because dad proud of pushing the pram and every now and again we stop in these great big posh mansions and he'd climb up the wall and just look over and i used to say to him what are you doing mick and he said, oh, I'm just looking at the gardens. He said, oh, I love the gardens in these lovely houses. He said, oh, there's a lovely bush over there. It's got lovely red flowers on. And that's what I thought he was doing. But I realised now, well, years later, that he was looking to see if he could go and rob it, mm -hmm. which I didn't know. I said, he kept it all quiet. But before, um, just after we got married, before he got sent down properly, when I had Mike and everything, when we lived in that flat, um, him... And John and his girlfriend were whispering all the time. Um, there's something going on. I don't know what it was, but there's something big going on that they'd been planning to do. Uh, and every time I walked in the room, they just went dead quiet and they wouldn't tell me anything at all about it. But every now and again, I'd, I'd just walk in and think, something's going on. And I heard the word about a train. I heard something about a train. I'm thinking, train? What's a train? But anyway, I never knew anything about it. And then a few weeks later, they all had all these new clothes. It's just for our wedding. 
and I'd seen these lovely white boots I wanted from Doll's Sis and they were dead knee high with a big platform, dead tight. Oh, they're gorgeous, but I couldn't afford them. And I thought, something's been going on. They're all got lots of money and clothes and that. So I said, oh, Mick, I said, I've seen some lovely boots. I really want them. Go lovely from a wedding dress when we get married because I had a mini on, mini dress on. And he said, oh, where are they? I'll go and get you them. And he got me them. And I love them boots. I love them. But um, there was something going on to do with the train. I don't know what it was. And Mick has never um, told me or reacted to that or anything when I've mentioned it to him. He's never... Yeah, but it, was it was it very secretive, Charlie? Oh, yeah. I never knew anything about crime. Nothing like that at all. Mm -hmm. That's why I nearly died of shock when it was seven years for this, seven years for that, seven years for that, seven years... Well, four years, it came to 28 years altogether to run currently. If he never said to leave him, do you think you would still be with him? I don't know. I think we change, don't you? When you get to a certain, I think every seven years you change. Yeah. I mean, your personality changes. I mean, I don't know because he was just taken away. So we've never had that like, I hate you and whatever and, and that's over. We've never actually had that, like you do with other husbands or whatever. And you think, I'm never going to go back to that. Mm -hmm. But it's different. And with him, because of that, it's like ongoing. And then you read in the paper all the time, is that you can't forget him. You can't. I mean, I used to go to mum and dad's house like every weekends. And um, they always just get the papers delivered. Every time we used to go, I used to read the paper. And there's always pages missing. And I couldn't believe it. I was thinking, what the hell's happened to this blooming paper and i'll say to dad dad i said this page is missing Where's number 10 or number 11 and that he said oh God, it's that bloody paper boy he said he reads half of it and loses half the pages and i thought yeah that must be it and that's it that's fine wherever and it's only when mike got older and he started to read papers himself i was thinking hmm, i'll have to go through the papers make sure there's nothing about his dad in them so i was emptying all the papers because there's always something about Mick in the morning. You could not get away from it. Yeah. That's that's the thing. That's kept, It's always there in your face. And it still is today. How hard is that for you to try and not move on? But because it, it became a celebrity like, know, over the years. Of, they've glorified it's, it's them in a way. You where, can't. You can't. Yeah. It's always there in your face. You can't forget. And Just the fact that Mike is a specific image, image of him. Sometimes when I've had a drink and I'm with Mike. Mike's chatting away to me. I'm looking at Mike. I'm, I'm, at a glance, I'm thinking, I'm with Mick. Mm -hmm. How hard is it? Because he's so, he's so, I mean, you can't forget him. Every time I look at Mike, I mean, I love Mike so much, but I'm just saying that he is so like, it's dead, dead you can't, you just mm. can't. That's why it's so ill in my head all the time. How hard has it been for your son, knowing who his father is? It's not that well. In what sense? He's missed his dad. I can't really go into that. I don't want to go into that. Mm -hmm. But he's fabulous now. He's been in hospital for a bit, but he's amazing now. He's really great. Is that he's a lot better. of pressure because of who his dad is as well and the dad not being there? I think um, it's got something to do with it, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think it would do, yeah. But I don't really want to say anything about Mick or... Yeah, of course, I understand. Or or whatever. But they never met for 26 years, that's correct? Yeah. And how was that feeling for him? Well, I said to Mike, I said, look, Mike, I said, your dad wants to get in touch. But now I said, I don't know what you want to do. I said, do you want to or not? I thought I'll have to leave it up to Mike to. So Mike said, no, I want to go and see my dad. And he did do, but they've always had a non-off relationship. So since then. But um, Is that hard for you? Well, it is, especially if Mick goes on about Mike and, you know, and I've got, I'm in the middle again all the time. You know, like was in the middle of my ex-husband because Mike wasn't his son, but I had two other children to him. But I always felt as if my my ex-husband was sort of picking on him more because it's not his son. Do you know what I mean? It was it's, it's, it's been bloody hard. Yeah. yeah. I wouldn't recommend it for anybody. Was Charlie ever sorry? Oh yeah, he's he's in the last letter to me he said, I'm so sorry after reading that book. You only read the book the other week. Mm -hmm. He said, I didn't realise what you've been through. He said, I'm so sorry. It really saddened me. Um, he knew I got pinched by, um, got robbed by one of the neighbours as well when it was all going on. And she did a moonlight flip, got my key as a friend to look after the house when I wasn't there, took most of my stuff. 
um, and things like that. So he said I was really saddened to, he's just said, I'm so sorry I wasn't there for you. You see, when, when you go to prison, well, I've not been to prison, but I mean, like your, your life's taken over, isn't it? Your life's taken over. You're told when to eat, when to go to the toilet, when to shower, when to get sleep or wherever, I don't know. But he said, when you're here outside and your husband's in there, it's not the same. I mean, you've got to get on with it. Nobody tells you to, oh, go to the toilet or clean your teeth. You're just thinking, oh, what shall I do now? I could hear all the cars in our kitchen in when I was in our house that used to have going up and down the road. And I used to think to myself, what? There's cars going up and down the road. Why are the cars going up and down the road? There's people in cars. They're going up and down the road. My husband's in prison. Mike's dad's in prison. What am I going to do? It was, oh, it was horrible. You just can't get on with life. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't look at clothes. If you go shopping, you feel sick. You just feel literally sick. You're thinking, what should I get for tea? Oh, I don't want anything. And you have to make an effort. Oh, it's just horrendous. It's horrible. It's the worst thing ever. It's something I would never, uh, never advise for anybody to go through. How much has it played a massive effect on your mental health? Well, I, I get this thing, these things like twitching everything all the time. Was that nerves? Um, well, I did at one point when um, Mike, going through a hard time, and Mike, Mike was going through a really, really bad time, actually. Um, he had this... Um, he actually got involved with drugs, but he, and he actually went to prison. But this was before your son. Yeah, this was our son. Mm -hmm. This was before um, they got in touch. I think it was. Yeah, I think it was before they got in touch after twenty six years, and that was horrendous for me. Mm -hmm. That was horrendous because I hate courts and prison, obviously because of Mick. You know, whatever. Um, but you worried that your son could have potentially led the same life as his dad? Well, that's what I thought. He was in there on remand for two months and it was horrendous, horrendous. Um, he was set up, he hadn't done anything, but then everybody says that. But he was involved with drugs. He used to start taking drugs, but wherever. Um, I remember going to see him one day. Mum came with me. It was the worst thing. It's the first time. Oh, it was horrible. And Mike looks so much like his dad, I thought, he's never going to get out. They're going to keep him here forever and ever and ever. They're going to keep him in. They're going to look at Mike and know who his dad is. And that's the end of it. Because that's what they've done to Mick. They've kept him in there for no reason at all, basically. Um, anyway, so that was it. My mum sort of kept me going for those few weeks. And then um, a bit after that, before he actually came out, he was allowed out, Mike should have gone to court and the prison should have taken him to court. And that's when he would have come home. Right. And I went to court and mum went to court with me. I think my ex-husband went with me. And um, no sign of Mike. He wasn't even in the court. The prison had forgotten to take him to court, even though he should have been in court that day. Now, apparently that's what they can do. See, these things have been happening to Mick all along. And I thought, oh, God, here we go. I came home. I went into my bedroom, it's right at the end of my other house, and I just screamed. I just I had a voice inside my head saying, you've got to scream. You just scream, just scream. The voice was just saying, don't worry about anything. Just scream your head off. Be as loud as you could. So I was screaming and screaming, screaming. A voice was saying, swear. I was swearing my head off. You wouldn't know. I was saying all this horrible stuff. I never swear. Never. I might say bloody hell, but I don't go. I was saying all this horrible language to nothing. I was shouting. I was screaming. And I thought, I just want to scream louder and louder. And I knew if I didn't stop at that point, I was just going to go right over the edge. But I had this voice telling me, stop. Don't keep on screaming. Scream louder. Scream louder. And I, it, was, it was horrendous. Anyway, d um, my ex-husband and my kids came running in then. And they calmed me down and I stopped. But they stayed with me for two weeks after that. They wouldn't leave me on my own at all. Wherever I couldn't even go to the loo without standing outside the door. But I, I, I really lost it then. I thought it's never going to get out. I couldn't do it again. I couldn't. I, I can't go through that twice. Really couldn't. How did so your right. ex-husband and Charlie get on? Did they ever speak? No, they never met. How did your ex-husband think of? Was that Charlie ever in contact with you when you, you were married again? Um, 
Now and again, when he's in contact, when he got in touch with Mike, he used to write to me. He knew we weren't getting on anyway, me and me and second husband, we weren't getting on. No, <laughs> uh, it was uh, it's horrid. But I'd get up in the night because um, I don't sleep very well and I'd come down to it. Even now, I still do it now. And I'll make a cup of tea or something. And if even if Leisha walks in and, and she says, oh, you, can't you sleep more? more? She walks in or something. I just say, oh, Mick. And I'm thinking, what am I saying, oh, Mick, for? I just go, oh, hi, Mick. I've done that to my ex-husband. I've done it to Ian, well, John, that died. I've done it to Alicia. It's just like, it's always there, you see. It's on my head. It's in my head all the time. It's just something you just can't get out of. Did you ever speak to anyone about that? No. Why not? No, because I just, uh, I am a strong, everybody says I am dead strong, and I am. I just, you have to be strong, don't you? But it just has resulted in me doing all this stuff again all the time. Touching this, when I go to bed, all those things, there's about six little shells. There's a dead plant, which I've got to touch um, so many times. Um, there's other things. And when with my daughter, she says, um, are you going to bed now? And go, shut up, shut up, shut up, shut up. I can't talk to you. I've got to do this. I've got to do that. 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 She says, okay, you just do your routine, mum. She says, I know you have to do all your routine. And it is, it's just, that's it. Is that through everything you've went through, being in the papers, married to Charlie, worrying about your son, where it's just had a yeah, massive toll on so, your yeah. mind? I think so. But you still look great for 70. You, you genuinely do look great for 70. So it must be doing oh, something thank you, right. Love. But it was only just 70. I'm not having me 70 for long. Yeah. It just took me 70 balloon out. <laughs> <laughs> so how is it then when he, Charlie's getting all the fame? Like, because he's a massive name like, in I the know. UK worldwide. Like, well, how that's, did, that's half the trouble. Does see, that that's make why, it worse for you? Yeah, because I can't get it out of my head. See, he's full on. Like ex ex husbands, they're nothing because they're not in your face all the time. You know, so, yeah, yeah. You have to be in the situation to understand it. I mean, with Mick, he's full on. I can't forget him. I can never forget him. I've never been able to forget him. It's just like yesterday. I still get all these horrendous, oh, sicky feelings of. I just feel. I often just feel like I'm in that course room in Chester. That was the horrend most horrible thing ever. How many times does he phone you per week? Or he'll phone about, sometimes he'll phone four times a day. It all depends. He has a, um, he, he phones regular, very regular. How many letters? But he has, you know, lately he's been such a good, he's been, um, since we got in touch properly, he's been, uh, what's the word? He's been really, really. Um, Calm, polite, nice. Yeah. Uh, Positive, 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 yeah. yeah. So if I'm getting all stressed out and you look as whatever. if you're, you look as if you're talking on your nerves though, like Pardon? you look as if you're on edge, talking on your nerves, like yeah, constant. Well, is... that's what I mean. I am, yeah, I am. That's what I mean. I am very panicky. I am very. I mean, if I go into any room or something, and I'll just suddenly turn round and go, Whoa! and there's no, nobody there, but I'm just jumping. Mm -hmm. But that is what I'm like. Did you ever worry being out in the streets that anybody maybe attack you or anything for being married no, to Charlie? No, because, I mean, he's never done anything nasty or horrible to anybody, has he? Mm -hmm. What's he done? He's not murdered anyone. He's not a child killer. He's not a paedophile. He's not a rapist. His crime, people think he is a murderer. People have said to me, <coughs> excuse me, people have actually said to me, well, he's a murderer, isn't he? That's why he's in prison. He's in prison because he's fought the system and they don't want to release him. But if he'd have been a murderer, um, he could have murdered about three or four people, killed kids, raped them, done all sorts. He'd be out now. Why do you think they've kept him in, though? There must be a reason. Because he is fighting the system. He's mm -hmm. getting us out there what prison is really like. Because the, he's been on the roofs, he's... Riot, oh yeah, he's been done. on more roofs than Santa Claus. <laughs> well, he has. And do you know what? Do you know what? He's actually spent more time on top of the roofs than the bloody pigeons. Mm -hmm. How does it when he gets put in solitary confinement? Like, oh, well, that's most of his life. That's been most of his life. That's what I mean. That's why he lives in. The, he's been left in a little tiny cell. Not even a proper cell. He hasn't even got a cardboard bed or anything. He lies on the floor. It's black, 
block, no light at all. There's a little slit in the cell door and they just throw his food in. And that's what, how he has lived for years and years and years. And that's why his eyesight's gone funny because he's in the dark all the time. So if he is taken out, he has to have special glasses. They don't realise that. They think, oh, he needs glasses because he's getting old. But it's because of how he's been kept. Yeah. Oh, no, it's horrible. But he hasn't even had the basic. It's it's scary the things that have happened to him. It really is. It's scary. Do you think he'll get out? Well, if people, the people that believe that he's never going to get out, um, I think they are going to op um, eat their words because he is going to come out. Because now it's open parole. They can't, you see, normally it's parole which is closed or something. I don't know what it's called. But it means that it's all set up. So the people for the parole are already saying, oh, yeah, we'll keep him in. It's a, it's a decision made beforehand. So, so, yeah. But now it's open. Because it's open, it gets other people in there. So members of the public can be there. They can all listen. And pe they are beginning to find out now the truth. They really are. They, they're finding out now what really goes on um, and all about his charities as well. But, <coughs> excuse me, I was going to say something. I've forgotten it again. Mm -hmm. Oh, my God. About I've his charities it. and getting out of prison. Yeah, he is going to get out of prison. He will. Do you think he'll stay out, though? Yeah. Well, he, he doesn't do crimes anyway. Yeah. That was only because he was in prison. You know, he's retaliating in the end. You know, he's not going to be happy if sitting all dressed up to go to his brother or his dad's funeral, um, waiting in his cell. What would you do if they came in and said, oh, you're not going? Would you say, oh, that's okay, don't worry? Or would you get bloody annoyed? Mm -hmm. They have used to cage him up, didn't they? They used to strap him. Yeah, to... he was a cage within the cage. Mm -hmm. He couldn't walk at all, couldn't move, just couldn't move. It cemented. He was in a little tiny cell, but he was cement in another cell beside, inside that, which he couldn't move at all. No, I mean, it's horrendous. It's, it's terrible. What's it like for him being in with all the worst kind of criminals on the planet, though? Like child killers and the Hannibals? Oh, and... he, hates, he hates them all. He hates all the prisoners. He hates them all. Mm -hmm. But he's actually helping some of the, the younger ones that come into prison. He's trying to get them, um, you know, on the the road to Redem proper... Redemption. Yeah, redemption. And to, you know, it's got set all sorts of things up, like saying, um, don't use a knife, use art uh, and things like that. He's got all these um, things that he's set up. can't remember what they're called now. Where can people buy his art? Oh, yeah, they do. Yeah, Because he makes lots of money. Where can they buy it? There's a website. Um, he has got a website. I'll leave um, it in the description at Salvador or something, yeah. Yeah, I would, I, would I would actually go to one run by Richard Booth. There's one run by Richard Booth, mm -hmm. but um, George runs one. Mm -hmm. What's your notes here? You want to check your notes? And... Yeah, um, I'm just thinking, what else did I want to say? Oh, I haven't told you about Big Brother. Yeah, what happened? About when I went for an addition to Big Brother. Yeah, what happened? Oh, yeah. Um, I passed them all. Passed, there's about, I had to go back again the following day. Mm -hmm. But because I work in Ann Summers in the toy part, the adult toys, I took this great big pink rabbit. Mick said, I've got to mention this because it's dead funny. Um, it was about this big, that wide. It was called the wave and it rippled. Uh, rabbit's got things on the end for the woman's outside bits and whatever. Anyway, this the last interview, I was in this like tent, like it's round tent, and it's just a seat in the middle and this like long, like just like a pole, just like, just that one thing sticking out, pointing at me. I mean, I sat in there for a bit. There's no, you know, nobody said anything. So after 15 minutes, I thought, I'm getting a bit bored here, so... I was looking at the tent walls and in the end I got up and started to stare down this little hole thing looking at that. And then I heard a, a voice, um, I'm sure it was Davina laughing her head off because she was doing it at the time because they were sitting outside. Anyway, the next thing um, Big Brother said to me, Irene, um, this is Big Brother here. Why are you holding a bright pink dildo in your hands? And I said, oh, it's not a dildo. It's a rabbit. And I said, it does things that men can't do. And, it said, I, and I said, I believe, you know, believe me, it's true. It does things men can't do. 
And then I said, I've actually sold one of these to an 86-year-old woman the other week, which is true, which I did. And then um, it all went dead quiet. And then he said, Irene, Big Brother wants you to excuse him. He's just going to be sick in the waste paper basket. <laughs> <laughs> but I really thought I was going to get on there mm -hmm. then. What but was... mixed films coming out, wasn't it? So I think that might have had something to do with it. I don't know. How was it when Bronson was getting made the film? When Tom Hardy played his part? He played good, but the film was rubbish. You think so? Yeah. So... The only time Mick was ever covered in paint, it made him out to be, I think it made him out to be um, a lunatic. You know, uh, I remember when I used to paint things, I had this thing about painting things and I used to paint flowers everywhere and that. I didn't know whether I was doing it right or not, but I'd just buy these bright paint, pan, uh, big things of paint and just paint everything. And one day when Mick had gone to work, because he used to climb those um, great big industrial tanks and stuff like that, you know, and used to paint them all. So <clears throat> when he was out at work, I thought, oh, I'm going to paint our um, bathroom. So I painted it all turquoise, but I only painted the bath. Anyway, Mick came home from work. And he just, the first thing he used to do, he used to jump into the bath and then put a suit on. So he jumped in the bath, but I didn't have a chance to send it to him. Didn't say, oh, well, I painted the bath and it's still wet. Anyway, the next thing I heard all this shouting and I ran up the stairs. There was Mick standing up in the bath covered in this turquoise paint. It was covered in it all because it hadn't dried, had it? So he was... Mm -hmm. But that's the only time he um, ever paint, painted himself. In your book, it's got a chapter called Spirits. Oh, yeah. Like, what's that about? Oh, that's me. I'm so, I've got so many spirits um, I've experienced. I'm quite psychic, actually. Um, I've had one in Ethel Austin's when I worked in Ethel Austin's. I went upstairs to the stock room. But the funny thing is, before I went went up the stairs to the stock room, because it used to be an old cinema before, and it's never been changed upstairs, I said to the girls, now if I don't come back, it was an Easter Saturday, don't come back, the ghost has got me as a joke. <coughs> so anyway, I went up. I went up in there. I was looking for some leggings for this customer. Couldn't find any. And the next thing I saw, just saw this black blur go like that. And I felt so cold. I was like freezing. And I started crying. Like tears were running down. I thought, there's somebody here. And I know nobody had come because the alarms hadn't gone off. Nobody had walked up the stairs, hadn't gone through the alarm door. And I thought, I've got to get out of here. I've got to get out of here. So I ran down the stairs, ran onto the shop floor. And Sarah, the man dressed at the time, came running up to me. Oh, Irene, Irene, she said, you okay? She said, you look as if you've seen a ghost. I said, I have. I said, it's an old man, an old bent over old man. I was absolutely terrified. I was so cold. I felt as if I'd been sitting in a freezer. It was that cold, not just cold, really, 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 really cold. And she said, oh, come on, don't worry. She said, we'll go in the office and we'll have a cup of tea. So I went up with her. She was holding my hand because I was shaking. She was actually shaking. We go into the little office. She puts the kettle, as she, she puts the kettle and as she goes to put the kettle on, um, I start getting so cold again and I'm just crying my eyes out. So can't stop it. I'm just so cr cold. And I go, Sarah, Sarah, he's here. He's here. He's putting, he's, he's right by you now. And she said, oh, bugger this. And she pulled me and we went into the other little room. She locked the door, but that wouldn't have done any good. But she, she, she really, really sensed it. She really did. <coughs> she really, really did. Now, I never knew what he was that I just saw the black blur, but I know I can draw a picture of him. Like that little man that used to come to me at night and hug me. I can draw a picture of his willy. <laughs> Pressed up. I can't. I can't. Even though I never saw it. Mm -hmm. You do. You know it in your mind. Anyway, Sarah mm -hmm. would never turn the lights off at night when she, fit, when she used to lock up. So that when she'd come in the morning, the lights were always on. And her mum gave her this special stuff. I can't remember what it was. She sprinkled it all down the stairs. She sensed it as well. But that was just the, one of the ones. So you can see people? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Does it scare you? Well, that did, yeah. That was uh, that was terrifying me. But I think it was a man called Johnny Pye, and I think he was the projectionist from the cinema because there was a little, um, cut, like, a, oh, a dead small room. We used to stock all the chairs in there, and I wouldn't go in there. And that used to be the projectionist room. And I think that's who it was. It was horrible. It's freezing in here. 
Hey? It's freezing in here. You're cold? Yeah. Oh, no, 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 no. You're just saying that because you're a ghost. Ooh. Your spirit. Did you, did you ever question your mental sanity then when you started seeing things like that, thinking that you're maybe losing your shit? Well, I didn't actually, because the funny thing was, I knew what to see. I, I knew. I damn well knew. I mean, and I found out later on, a couple of years after, that when, before it turned into F. Lawson's, that particular shop, it was called Lennon's, which is like a grocery store. And the girls in Lennon's used to say there was a ghost up in the stock room, but he was friendly. Right? He wasn't friendly to me. I, I was terrified. You don't get like that if it's, it's a nice ghost. You don't get scared like that. But, oh, I haven't told you, there's so many things. And Ann Summers, we've had a few ghosts in Ann Summers, right? Um, and we've moved to about three different shops. I've been there 16 years still. And then one of the shops we went in, I said the same thing again to the girls. You know, all locked door. When you walk off the shop floor, it's all gets alarmed. Um, if not back in a minute, I was just going to put a bra away. This customer brought back, put it back in the stock room. I said, just just wait for me. That must be my saying to to get them all. Anyway, I walk, walked into the back and then I went to the stock room and there's like a door here, and I stopped, it was open. And I just stopped because all I could hear was cardboard ripping, like a big cardboard box. You know, the noise, really strong. It's just cardboard ripping. So I stopped thinking, what's going on here? Who's doing that noise? There's nobody here. And the next thing, right in front of me, this great big cardboard box, because we keep all our cardboard boxes, we get stock in, and we put all our sale items, items in them was just going like that up and down in front of me very very great big box very very slowly walking going like that and all the time you could hear this this cardboard ripping and I was thinking oh my god so I turned round ran out ran into the office where the manager was and it was Tom at the moment he, he was just uh, the relief manager and I said Tom 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 I said he's back the ghost is back because we had things before with him and Tom does not believe in ghosts. He, he just looked at me to say, God, you're, nut, you're bloody nutty, you are, Irene. Because that's what they think anyway. Yeah, 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 you know? I guess it, yeah, yeah. And I thought, well, I don't care. But I said, he's back. So he said, right. He said, I'll prove to you. He said, I'll put the cameras on. So he put the cameras on. And guess what? There's me standing right at the doorway. And there's this big cardboard box, empty, mind you, just going very slowly moving up and down up and down and as soon as I turn round to run out it stops it doesn't do it do it again what does Charlie say when you've got a ghost that you say there's a ghost rubbing his willy on you well I don't, I don't know if he believes in ghosts but I do because there's so many who's the ghost with his naked ghost a naked ghost yeah. Who is that naked who ghost who says there's a ghost oh no he's not naked what he does is he's got no legs but he's a womanizer and in, in his time, apparently, he was such a womanizer and he misses all that. So he just wants to cuddle me. But because he's got no legs, he, he's got very, very strong arms. So he just comes behind me all the time and he puts his arms around me and pulls me to him so I can feel all his bits. Oh, it's, hot, it's scary. What do you do? I was terrified and he was getting stronger and stronger because the more frightened you get, he was doing it. More, as soon as I got divorced the second time, he was coming more and more. He used to just do it once every blue moon, mm -hmm. you know, the whole the whole time, just once every blue moon. All the kids used to say, we always thought it was a little boy, but it was him. But when I got divorced, he was coming like once a month and then it was like twice a month. And then he was coming nearly every night and I'd just sit up all night. I'd have all the lights on, telly on, I was too terrified to go to sleep. In the end, Leisha, you just met before, she said, look, mum, she said, you're going to have to get rid of him because you can't, you know, you, you're just not sleeping. You can't cope with this anymore. And she'd met a, a medium that come into work. That was a, just another nurse. She'd know she's a medium, but apparently she she was a medium. So Leisha just said, oh, you get, you know, help my mum. She's this. So this woman phoned me up in my house um, one night when Leisha was in ballots and was on my own. And um, she, as soon as she spoke to me, she said, Irene, she said, you're right, you have got a man with you. But she said he's got no legs. She, she fell to her knees, she said. But she said he's only a small man and he's not harmful, but he's a womanizer. He's had a bad accident. He's lost his legs below the knees and he just wants to cuddle you. I'm thinking, well, what, why me? 
you know, why why come and cuddle me out of all the bloody people that you can come and cuddle, you know. But anyway, she said I can at least they get rid of him. And she did. She got rid of him. And uh, I was terrified that night. I had all the windows open, all the doors open. And Nisha was ringing me up saying, are you all right, Mum? Are you all right? And I was going, well, they're here, they're here. She said, I'm going to send two spirits to get rid of him for you. She said, don't worry. She said, you will sense them. I mean, one minute you'll sense them, but they're not here to harm you. They're just going to take away. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And they did. And they were moving like all around the house. Because one minute I was really cold and freezing. The next, I just felt so warm. I was saying to Alicia, oh, it's okay. It's okay. I'm warm again now. They've gone. And the next minute I'll be saying, oh, the back. Alicia, we've got to the back, the back, the back and all that. But then... After about 10 minutes, she texted me and said, it's okay, Irene. She said, they've gone now. Don't know where they're gone. She never, mm-hmm. they don't actually tell you. But Leisha actually told me she was in Bal at that time. And she said, she didn't want to tell me at the time, but she was getting all my feelings when I was all anxious and saying, oh, they're here. She was feeling that. When I was all cold, she was feeling it. But her main worry was, I haven't got him now. He's not come with me now, has he? I don't want to be with him now. Did you ever question your sanity, though, when all this stuff started happening? No, because happening? I do believe in... Well, yeah. I mean, I saw my grandson. He just came. It was just... He was, it was only a baby when he died. He was 10. 10 when he came, and that's how old he would have been. Mm-hmm. And it was I just so... so it was lovely. That was lovely. I was yeah. wide awake. How but was, they do normally take hold of your mind when you're asleep, because that's what makes them strong. They take hold of your soul, because your soul is you, isn't it? Mm-hmm. So how's the relationship with you and Charlie now? Oh, it's great. I mean, as I say, he phoned last night. He said to mention a few things, which what? I have done, about um, uh, Bell Marsh and the hijackers. In 1996, um, three hijackers um, hijacked a plane from Baghdad, was it? I think I think it was Baghdad. And they took it to Stansted in London um, to escape Saddam Hussein. Um the next, they, they tried to escape, this isn't mixed words, tried to escape one lunatic and they ended up two cells away from Mick, from Charles Bronson in Belmarsh, um, which he did take them hostage. So he said, they're trying to escape one um, lunatic and they end up with right next door to another one. But he took them hostage. He tied them up like uh, roast chickens ready to be roasted, wherever. And then after about three days, he let one of them Lucy untied him and made him tickle his feet. <laughs> anyway, he got seven oh. years for that. And I think the hijackers only actually got three years for actually hijacking the plane. But so that get... just shows you, doesn't it? Yeah. You know, you can't win. You um, escape in Saddam Hussein and ends up by Mick. Did they ever try and escape? Them. Charlie? No. Never? He can't. He's been, he's not in normal prison. He's, he's, he's uh, bald and chained and everything. He's, how big, no how, how big is he? What height is he? How, how, what weight is he as well? Uh, well, he's very muscly. Very, he's, he's, Mike's the same. Quite a big build. Yeah. But he's not, not dead tall. He's a lot taller than me. Mm-hmm. Um, same as Mike. They're like big, but they've got a lot of strength. A lot, very strong. Do you think you'll ever get back with Charlie? Uh, on camera <laughs> <laughs> oh i don't know i um, just stay we, are, we are always going to uh be really good friends as soon as he comes out i, I just really want him out i just i've always wanted him out mm-hmm. and mike i just want them both i want i want mick out and i'd like mick to sort of take over from me so i don't have to worry anymore about my out. yeah <laughs> you know but but no i would but we are always going to be really really good friends mm-hmm. and um as soon as Mick comes out, he'll have to go to a hostel. So what's going to happen is um, I'm going to go and stay over in a hotel and then he's allowed out in the morning about 8 o'clock, something like that. And we're going to spend the whole day shopping. And he's going to buy some suits and he's going to treat me. And then we're going to have fish and chips. Oh, no, we're going to have a nice steak for lunch, proper steak with mushrooms and onions. He's dying to have that. And then we're going to have fish and chips for tea that night. Mm-hmm. How was it writing the book? The truth, the whole truth. Oh, it's good. I Nothing actually wrote that during the um, the pandemic, the pandem- pandemic, yeah, the pandemic, mm-hmm. because I wasn't going to it. Nobody was coming. I've been meaning to do it for ages and ages and ages. I really have, but things haven't 
I've not had the right peace of mind to be able to do it. But three things of good things have come out of that pandemic. One is that um, I got to write that book, even though um, Steve has made, condensed it very, very small, but it has got a lot in. And um, then another thing that makes being allowed to have an open pr parole, mm -hmm. parole meeting. And then the third one was it killed, um, was it Peter Suthcliffe, the... Yeah. Yeah, so it killed. He he died of COVID, didn't he? So that's three good things that's actually come out of this pandemic. Yeah, <laughs> but I am writing another book now because everybody wants to read it because they just think it's hilarious. Where can people buy your book? Well, they have to get it off Steve Mojim Publishing. Okay, I'll leave the link in the description. Yeah, it is Mojim, I think. Mojo Rising Publishing. Yeah, we'll leave the link in the description anyway for people to buy your book. Oh, yeah. Would you like to finish up on anything, Aiden? Um, I think that's it. Is that, is that... Yeah, no, it's fine. Will that be all right? Yeah, it's your story, Aiden. It's just how you met Charlie, talk about your book and a little bit about yourself. That yeah. It's just your life, babe, and that's what you do and that's what you see spirits and you, you yeah. married one well, of I'm them. Very you married Charlie yeah. and that's just your life. But I'll leave the link in the description. Again, thanks for coming on today and telling your story. Oh, I yeah. thoroughly oh, enjoyed it's that. It's a pleasure. Lovely yeah. to meet you. Likewise, Liz. I wish you all the best for the future. Hopefully, Charlie gets out and I can, I can oh, sit yeah. and I'm have sure a chat with you both. I'm sure he will. God bless you. Yeah, and you, love. Thank you.